Most trading card games last only two years. Time and time again, we see them make the same mistakes and crumble for the same reason. Falling victim to the seven deadly sins of trading card games. Imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery, but it's the weakest form of competition. When it comes to product design, people tend to gravitate towards whatever they're most familiar with, the longest running, the most popular, whatever. And releasing a remarkably similar product for essentially the same price just ensures that people will continue to buy the more familiar product unless you have some sort of killer app that sets your product apart from the competition. The same applies to the world of trading card games. It's important to stand out amongst the sea of other games, especially when you're facing the monolithic power of the big three, Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh, and Pokemon. You can't beat Magic at its own game, despite the many, many people who have tried. And in a lot of cases, the people who play those games learn just how darn fun it is to play Magic. And so they go back to playing Magic. You need to do something unique, a striking visual style, an engaging core mechanic, a response to another game's major problems. A funny card shape? Uh... Okay, I know I talk a lot about the importance of standing out and being unique and interesting, but there is exactly one design element that you should probably borrow from the big boys, and that is the actual physical composition of your cards. When it comes to card shapes, there are pretty much two different sizes of cardstock. Standard size, two and a half by three and a half inches, and small size, which is a quarter inch smaller in both dimensions. You got the big size and little size, America size and Japan size, Magic size and Yu-Gi-Oh size. But I mean, why would you go with that? A unique physical design is a point blank way to set yourself apart. Nobody's gonna think you're like Magic if your cards are shaped like lightning bolts. This conundrum, however, can be solved with two words, standardized parts. You know those computers or game consoles or vacuum cleaners you buy? Odds are good that even between different brands, they share a lot of common parts. This practice of standardized parts is designed to help things like mass production, design, and repair. And you know what else uses standardized parts? Print shops. Card games, even big ones, don't usually own the plants where they print their cards. Instead, the work is farmed out to print shops who already have the properly aligned cutting and packing tools to mass produce and order. Making a game that is out of standard with these sizes or are made out of plastic or something will incur additional costs in development as new tooling would have to be made to handle this. Maybe not such a big problem for a massive conglomerate, but for anybody just starting out, you should probably shelve the revolutionary new lightning bolt design you have in mind. What about tarot standard? That's a size that most print shops have access to, right? Now there's an idea! With oversized cards like this, you can slap on big pictures of amazing artwork with plenty of room left over for card text. And it's a standard size that's easy to get printed, right? No problems! Uh, but... Remember that whole standardized parts thing I was talking about before? Funny thing about card games, that applies to the front end as well. You see, trading card games are an evolution of plain old trading cards made for like sports and movies and stuff. And over the course of the industry's life, a ton of additional products were made in order to store and display these cards, something trading card games piggybacked off of when they were first rolled out. Things like boxes, binder pages, and sleeves, and all trading cards fit into the standard sizes that have been around for years. But what about Yu-Gi-Oh! It came along and had a totally different card shape from Magic and Pokemon and all the others. Well, to be honest, Yu-Gi-Oh! got lucky. You see, Yu-Gi-Oh! may not have been a standard size in America, but they were standard size in Japan, hence the comment from earlier. A ton of games out of Japan use this smaller size. My old Digimon cards are this size, for example. And the fact that they could still work with stuff made for American-sized cards meant they dodged the bullet long enough for the product market to catch up. People like it when they can just get out some old sleeves and binders to stash the cards from a new game in. Even if they find they're short on sleeves, they can easily obtain more. It also makes it easier to license out supporting products like sleeves and boxes with your game's artwork put on them when your cards fit inside products that already exist and can be easily manufactured. However, that doesn't work for Tarot Standard. They're big. Too big to fit into the sleeves and binders made for standard size card games. Sleeves and binder pages for tarot cards do actually exist, though, again, they are a niche product. And I think these are actually pages for photo albums. 
but they are rare, expensive, and importantly, most avid game players don't have a set of them lying around. Not to mention, they're a huge pain to shuffle. I mean, I guess a tarot standard game could still work, but there need to be some pretty serious changes on the front end for that to happen. The only substandard card size I've seen that seems to be growing in popularity is photograph size. Three and a half by five inch double size cards that are roughly the size of a typical photograph. These cards are never used for decks though. Instead, they're used for cards that never need shuffling and represent characters, avatars, or commanders. I don't know if they make sleeves for these and photo album pages are a bit of a rarity now, not to mention they're hard to store in a lot of card boxes, but they're not designed to be in any situation where they take a lot of abuse. The Transformers game in particular gave their booster packs a double wide pack to handle this, though again, the cards here are limited and it's made by a major company. But then we get into the really crazy stuff, like the games that use cards made out of plastic. I've seen clear plastic cards used in card games exactly four times. Once it was in the form of premium character cards, similar to the photo sized cards from earlier. Another time it was also character cards who used the clear plastic to build your character stats combined with other cards. And then there are the oddballs, which, oh boy. Hecatomb was a card game released by Wizards of the Coast, the makers of Magic the Gathering, in the dead center of the TCG storm of the early to mid aughts. It was a horror themed game that had a gimmick where you stitched together abominations by stacking the creatures on top of each other. The powers and effects of the previous monsters bleeding through the clear window around the card to grant those powers to the combined form. And then of course there was... Yeah, I did a couple of videos about this game a few years ago. Renekai was a card game tied to a show about a group of sociopaths who had the nerve to call themselves protagonists. Back in the day, I said the show wasn't focus tested enough, but in hindsight and better educated, I am dead certain that it was focus grouped into the ground until anything genuine, positive, or enjoyable was sanded off. The game itself suffered from an insane lack of structure, the opposite problem of unmixable attributes, as well as a particularly pernicious three card unbreakable loop strategy that the developers were unwilling to murder the hypotenuse on. It lasted two sets. Now, in the case of the games that start with Dragon B, the clear cards weren't really a problem. They were used in small quantities and for special occasions. These were cards you didn't have to stockpile or shuffle or even sleeve really outside of protecting them, though the thickness of the plastic made that kind of difficult. The problems came with these two. Both games went with plastic for the same reason, to have clear elements that could be used to stack effects from multiple cards in one place. However, both games ran into serious problems, both front end and back end. First of all, Hecatomb was a combination of both an unusual material and a non-standard card size. One problem though, what the heck kind of sleeves and binders are gonna work for cards like this? I mean, this game was made by Wizards of the Coast, so they had the resources to make their own lousy deck box, but no third party companies had anything for those cards to keep them stored or protected. They also chip rather easily, though that might be from the fact that these cards are over 15 years old. Redekai though, oof. This was a game whose problems stemmed beyond just its lack of structure and bad TV show. You see, a huge part of trading card games is that you don't know what's on the top of your deck and you don't know what your opponent has in their hand. This is done by using universal card backs where every card of every attribute has the same back as all of the others. There are, of course, exceptions to this. Character cards or cards that go into separate piles should probably have alternative backs, but if the goal is to have a randomized set of cards in a pile, they all need the same back. Hecatomb managed this just fine thanks to its unusual card shape, the only fringe benefit it got, but Redekai, by design, could not. Redekai cards all have a different assortment of clear spaces due to the central gimmick of player health, special abilities, and defenses being on different windows, which makes it impossible to have matching card backs on all of the cards. You can't really sleeve them either, as you'd have to immediately remove them to stack them on top of the others. This problem was compensated for by an awkward system of plastic junk that I really don't want to go into here. Wait for sin number six for that one. But still, Redekai is a stellar example of how using plastic cards for their unique properties can create an inescapable problem. 
Oh right, the plastic, the problem that both of these games have in common. The big thing about plastic, it's way more expensive than cardstock. More expensive to produce, more expensive to print on, just a world of difference. Even bigger than the markup for printing in Tarot Standard, which there is a markup for printing in Tarot Standard, by the way. This isn't that big a problem when a scant few of your cards are plastic, but when all of your cards are plastic, that starts to add up a whole lot more. In fact, Wizards of the Coast themselves said that the cost of materials is why they canceled Hecatomb. I mean, clearly that's not all that was going on, otherwise I probably wouldn't have found these cards brand new at Goodwill, but there's definitely a kernel of truth to it, seeing as Redekai tried to compensate for their high material costs by essentially charging double for all of their products compared to other games. You can imagine how well that worked out. I mean, actually you don't have to imagine it, the game lasted barely two sets. Now that I think of it, Redekai is just a bluster cluck of bad design decisions that I should probably go over again now that I can more properly articulate my thoughts on it. But is that really fair? Could these games have been made any other way? Well, as I stated, Redekai's system was too flawed to ever work in a physical game, and probably should have been a phone or browser game from the start, but Hecatomb? Its system got recreated into the recent Digimon card game using only paper cards, with the abilities that do or do not carry over being clearly marked by different sections on the card. Making these cards plastic pentagons was, indeed, just a gimmick. So yeah, if you're looking to revolutionize the world of card games, fiddling with the actual medium of the card itself probably isn't the way to go, unless you've like got the backing of a major company that can make all of the needed support products or something, but if you're a self-published, like you put your orders through Cardimundi or something, you should probably pick a size and stick to it. But again, standard card size is the only aspect of the big games that you should try to emulate. It's the rules and mechanics of a game that make it stand out after all. Keep that in mind, and you too can avoid falling victim to one of the seven deadly sins of card game design.